especially talking about how we pray accurate New Testament prayer. We've also talked about how we are to get the spiritual mind of the Lord Jesus Christ, emphasizing that, how it's to be established in us. And tonight we're going to talk about more things that are important. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again, we've been born again, unto a livelier living hope by or through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To what? To an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. You must understand that when you get born again, you now have come into a spiritual inheritance. This inheritance is in heaven, in the document of the New Testament. It is reserved in heaven for us, and this inheritance has got all the, the inherited promises that belong to us and have been given unto us that we are to see come to pass in our life. We know Jesus is the one who made this covenant, and we see in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, speaking of him, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, son whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Well, <coughs> Jesus is an heir of all things, and we are in him. And what does that then make us? We are heirs of all things as well. We know this from Romans in chapter 8. We see in verse 17, if children, we've been born from above, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. He's an heir of all things that makes you an heir of all things as well. And because we're in him, we have this inheritance that we're to possess. It's a spiritual inheritance. For Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. This inheritance now is ours in Christ. We belongs to us. We do have to possess these promises experientially in our life. And so, down in verse 16, where he's praying for them, verse 17, he says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding, your mind, this means, being enlightened that you may know what's the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, because you are to possess the inherited promises that belong unto you. Now that we are in Christ, we are able to possess the inheritance of the New Testament. Colossians 1.12, giving thanks unto the Father, who hath made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. You already be a partaker of this entire inheritance. He's an inherited, inherited uh, the heir of all things. You and I are joint heirs with him. We are to possess the entire inheritance. And that's not only the New Testament promises. You must realize we're not under the Old Testament, but all the Old Testament promises carry over into the New Testament because of what it says in Galatians 3.29, if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We have all the promises from the Old Testament as well as the New Testament that are part of our inheritance. We don't walk according to Old Testament law. We walk according to New Testament law. Nonetheless, all the promises are belong unto us. And how do these promises, how do we discover these promises and see them come to pass? Well, they're in the Word. Acts chapter 20 Verse 32, now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. It's the word that is, brings his favor to us in the New Testament, which is able to build you up, not only to build you up, but also to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So the word will give you the inheritance as you do what is necessary to see it come to to pass. Now just because you're an heir doesn't mean that you're going to see all these things come to pass right away. You've got to grow up in the Word, in the things of God. We see in Galatians chapter 4, verse 1, it says this, Now I say that the heir, 
as long as he is a child, the word child is the word nepios, nepios means an infant. As long as he's an infant, well that means he hadn't grown up yet. Differs nothing than a servant, though he be Lord of all. He's got the right to everything, but until he grows up in the things of God, you're not going to be able to take hold of these promises. That's why you and I must grow in the Word, grow up to coming out of spiritual babyhood. And how does that happen in our life? Well, that happens because of the fact that we begin to be a doer of the Word consistently. Hebrews 5, verse 12, verse 13 says, Everyone that uses milk, and who is this talking about, the one who uses milk? Well, that's an infant, isn't it? A baby. He's unskillful or inexperienced, this means, in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. Again, the word nepios. So how do we come out of the baby stage, even though we're an heir, so that we can see all these things come to pass? It's by becoming experienced in the word of righteousness, by doing the word. Doing the word is how you grow up. Even though all the inherited promises are yours, you've got to go and grow up in the things of God to possess them. And there's tremendous things that we are inherited of. We see over in Matthew chapter 19, in verse 29, which speaks of our inheritance. Where the one who's forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, father, mother, wife, child, children, lands, or my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and inherit, shall inherit everlasting life. Our inheritance that we're to possess when we meet the conditions is everlasting life. We're also heirs of the kingdom. James chapter 2, verse 5 says that. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him, or, important to understand, this is a present tense, meaning those who are loving him continually, and remember who's loving him are the ones who are keeping his commandments, they're keeping his sayings, doing what the word says. So, you're an heir of the kingdom, and you are to possess this and rule and reign under Jesus Christ. Well, we also got to realize we're an heir of all the promises of God. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, says this, that you be not slothful, but followers of them, who through faith and, not patience, but the word macrothumia, which means long-suffering, long-suffering, are inheriting the promises, not inherit like they've already happened. The word inherit is a present tense. This is why Young's translates it correctly, are inheriting the promises, showing it is a work in process as you are growing up, doing the word, and taking hold of these promises to see them come to pass through your faith and long suffering in the face of the circumstances that haven't changed. Your faith will bring forth the victory, but while your faith is at work, then you're going to be, have to be long-suffering until the changes have come. We come down to verse 17. We're in God, willing more, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, which is what you and I are, the immutability of His counsel confirmed up by an oath. How can we know that God will perform the promise? as he's made us an heir, because he confirmed it by an oath. As it goes on and says, that there, and back there, he swore by himself, because he could swear by none greater, swear by the greater, an oath for a confirmation is the end of all, of them an end of all strife. Now, he confirmed it by an oath, so that means now, because of the covenant that he has made with us now, you and I, as heirs of promise, we know absolutely that He will bring it to pass when we meet the conditions, of course. This promise is an eternal inheritance, as we see. It's not just for a time. Hebrews 9.15, For this cause He's the mediator of the New Testament, speaking of Jesus, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the First Testament, they which are called, which is all of us, might receive, if we meet the, the conditions, 
because this is a subjunctive mood, meaning you have to meet the conditions. They don't automatically happen. The promise of eternal inheritance. This is an eternal inheritance that we manifest for us in our life. We also see over in 1 Peter chapter 3, he wants us to possess every blessing. Verse 9, he says, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that you are thereunto called that you should inherit a blessing. Well, you're to be a blessing, so you inherit a blessing. You can see the blessings of God come to pass in your life as you do the things that he says. But there must be obedience on your part. Remember, there's conditions. There must be obedience. We can see this pointed out. Remember, Abraham was to go and possess this inherited land that was promised to him. Hebrews 11.8, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive for inheritance, obeyed. You and I have to obey in order to go in and possess what has, God has for us. He went out not knowing whether he went. He followed what God told him to do, and he went in to possess that which he had for him. We also see over in Colossians chapter 3, verse 24, it speaks of something. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Inheritance also, because you meet the condition, brings us rewards. It's the reward of the inheritance when you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We serve the Lord, you're going to get rewards, and that's part of your inheritance. You are to receive this. But that, of course, what's the condition for that? You've got to be sure you're, of course, serving the Lord and following Him. And also, God expects you to conquer in every situation. You're able to do it through the Word of God as you act upon it. And we see in Revelation 21.7 the statement made, He that overcometh, this word means to conquer and carry off the victory. And when it says overcometh, well, again, this is present tense, meaning ongoing, continuous action. He who is conquering continually and carrying off the victory continually shall inherit all things. As you gain the victory, you possess all the inherited promises that belong to you. And I'll be his God, and he shall be my son. You have a spiritual inheritance. You've got to meet the conditions to possess it, and you're to possess everything that God has for you. Well, in order to understand this inheritance, what do we have? Well, we have all these blessings and promises that have been given to us, and they are spiritual. Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, that's past tense, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly the places, really just in the heavenlies, existing in heaven in Christ, places is not there in the Greek. And where, of course, why is it? Because the New Covenant, the New Testament document is in heaven. And remember, all these things are reserved for us to possess. So he's blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. All the spiritual blessings have already been given to us. Notice they're spiritual blessings. You're going to take hold of the spiritual blessings to see them come into manifestation in your life. Also, these are promises that are given unto us. 2 Corinthians 1.20, For all the promises of God in Him are yea, yes, and in Him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Every promise belongs to us. In fact, we even see a scripture over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In verse 21, when he speaks of, Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Every promise, every blessing belongs to us. And that's what it's talking about when it talks about all things are ours. Jesus came to bring blessings upon us. He wants us to be blessed in everything. Of course, again, you do have to meet the conditions. Look what it says, Acts 3.26. Unto you, first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. He wants to bless us. And then it tells us, of course, what we need to do in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. 
And we certainly aren't going to see the blessings if we're walking in sin or walking in the flesh or walking in any kind of iniquities whatsoever. We have to meet the conditions. And these tremendous promises, as you possess them and these blessings, this inheritance that belongs to you, you're going to come to the place of becoming a partaker of the divine nature. This is why you need to possess all the promises and the blessings. They produce, produce that result. Look what it says. 2 Peter 1, in fact, if we go back a moment, it's speaking about His divine power has given to us all things that pertain into life and godliness. That's our inheritance, everything we have need of, the promises, the blessings. How? Through the precise, correct knowledge of Him. That's why you've got to know exactly what the Word says. Who has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, these promises are tremendous. They're great and precious promises that by these you might become, again, not be, this is the word ginomai, which means become. And when it says, again, that you might become, because it's a subjunctive mood verb, it means it's a conditional statement, automatic, not automatically, you might become partakers of the divine nature if you possess them. If you don't possess them, you won't be a partaker of the divine nature. That tells you you're not a partaker of the divine nature until you possess your inheritance, your promises, and the blessings that God has given us. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust, of course, we turn away from all the things of the flesh and the world and all these evil things, and we take hold of the promises, the blessings that have been given to us from heaven. Also, we are to enter into th these possessing these promises to enter into a spiritual rest. Hebrews chapter 4. Let us fear, therefore fear, lest the promise being left us, or left behind, of entering into his rest, that any of you should seem to come short of it, otherwise come behind in it. We don't want to come behind in possessing any promise. He wants us to possess everything. And again, that's what's necessary to not only become a partaker of the divine nature, but also to enter into His rest. We enter into His rest when we finished accomplishing the work of working out our own salvation and seeing Him accomplish the great work. How's it come again? Through the Word. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the Word preached did not profit them. That shows you something. The Word doesn't automatically profit you. Something has to be done with the Word. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You must mix your faith with the Word that you heard by doing what He says, speaking, acting upon it, working your faith in some aspect, mixing your general spirit of faith with that which you heard, which brought specific faith to you. And we'll be talking more about that here uh, in a moment. We come to verse 3. For we which have believed do enter. Does that mean we already have entered? No. Not a good translation, really, because it misses the point of the present tense. What's the present tense? Ongoing, continuous action. The way this should be translated is, we which have believed are entering, that shows the ongoing process, into rest. It is a process as you are possessing the promises, as you become a partaker of the divine nature, as you're mixing your faith with the word that you hear, you're not leaving any promise out and left as you whatsoever. He says, I've said, I've sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. He spake in a certain place the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Six days he worked, seventh day he rested. You know, the six days really is a revelation that that's the time that man has to work out his salvation because six, a day is a thousand years. And the six days is the time of man, him having that lease on earth, which of course was given in the hands of Satan, and it's his time when he now is going to work for the 6,000 years during that time to enter in and possess the promises and become like the Lord because God, when He finished His work, 
He rested on the seventh day. Remember, they couldn't work on the seventh day because you got to have the work done in six days. There isn't any opportunity to work on the seventh day. You got to get it done in the six days before the end of the 6,000 years. In this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter in, they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. That means it's possible that you wouldn't enter in too if you allow unbelief to get a hold of you. You must do what's necessary to enter into what he has for you. We come down and realize this in verse 8, the fact that the rest didn't come in the Old Testament. Because it says, if Jesus, but it's Jesus, the same word for Joshua in the New Testament, it shouldn't be translated Jesus. It should be translated Joshua because it's speaking of the Old Testament era. If Joshua had given them rest, which was in the Old Testament, he would not have afterward have spoken of another day, which is the New Testament time when Jesus came on the scene. He did not give us rest. There remains, therefore, a rest. This is the Sabbatismos rest, which the Sabbath is all about, entering into that spiritual rest. This is a spiritual rest to the people of God. And who are the people of God today? It's us who are born, born again. For he that is entered into his rest, he's also ceased from his own works. Well, that meant he finished the work. As we finish the work, we'll enter into his rest, just as God did. God didn't enter into his rest until he finished the work. You won't enter into his rest until you finish the work. So what do we do? We're going to work to, to enter into that spiritual rest, just like there's conditions to possess the promises of God and, and to be a partaker of the divine nature and these things. Same thing, to enter into his rest. We can't come short of it, remember. Let us labor, be diligent. This word means spadazzo. Actually means diligence, but it should be translated as. Young does it. May we be diligent. And when it tells us this again, this doesn't mean it's automatically going to happen. This is a conditional statement again. You're going to have to meet the condition of being diligent, therefore. Diligent to what? To do what he says and work out your own salvation to enter into that rest lest any man fall up to the same example of unbelief. Now, these guys that didn't enter in, the same could be so today if we would fall up to the same example. Well, we're going to believe and we're going to enter in as we're going to be diligent to do what, meet the conditions to enter in to that spiritual rest, having completed the work. And we come to the place then of entering into it. Now, how are we going to do all this? We're going to do it through our faith. That brings us to the next point. Faith is a spiritual force that is to be operative in your life. God wants every one of us to function and walk by faith in everything that we do. Galatians chapter 2, you must understand this first of all. Verse 20, I'm crucified with Christ. The old you is dead, remember. You've got a brand new spirit. Nevertheless, I live, got it, something new now, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, because that's the new spirit you get when you're born from above. The life which I now live in the flesh, you didn't get a new flesh, you got the same body, you got a different spirit, the spirit of Christ, but you do live this life in the flesh, in this body, in this dispensation. How do I live it? I live by the faith of the Son of God. I don't live by my own ability or what I want to do by a physical directed life or a soul realm directed life. No, I, I live by the faith of the Son of God. That is a spiritual faith who loved me and gave himself for me. You're going to live, that's the faith of Jesus. Well, that means every one of us live by the faith of Jesus. Well, that must mean that every one of us has the faith of Jesus. And that's correct. Second Corinthians chapter 4 Verse 13 says this, We, having the same spirit of faith, notice, faith is not a feeling, it's not a mental thing, it's not a natural thing, it's a spiritual thing. It's a spirit of faith. And notice, we all have the same spirit of faith. You got the spirit of faith when you got the spirit of Christ. You have the spirit of Christ, 
you have the spirit of faith, the faith of the Son of God. Every one of us has the same. So, there's nothing wrong with your faith. It all depends on what you're doing with it, because we all have the same spirit of faith. And this faith that it speaks of, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. Obtained is like obtained by a lot, which is like because you're an heir inheritance. You and I, because we're an heir now, we have like precious faith, the same precious faith. It's the faith of Jesus with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the one who accomplished what was necessary for us to have it. Now, another thing that's important, Romans chapter 12, this is a spiritual faith. It's a spirit of faith that you have in you. That's what you live by now. Romans 12, verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man a measure of faith. Not the, it's not there in the Greek. It's a measure of faith. Well, that means we all have a measure of faith, which is all that we have need of. We have a measure of faith, but then what you do with your faith is what's important, because your faith is to grow. Your faith is to increase and become strong. Your faith is to develop as you work your faith, and that is so important to realize. We know this from 2 Thessalonians 1.3, how it's going to grow. 2 Thessalonians 1.3, we're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it's meet, because your faith groweth exceedingly. It is to grow and become strong. And the charity of every one of you all toward each other abounds. So your faith is to grow. Now, this means that faith, something that you already have a measure of it, you have to see this faith develop in your life. And of course, because it's a spirit of faith, where is your focus going to be? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. While we look not at the things that are seen in the natural, but the things that are not seen. Now that would be in the spiritual realm. The things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. You are going to tap into the unseen things, the things that are not seen with your spirit of faith. Remember, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's the evidence or the proof of the things that are not seen. Your faith is a spiritual faith that taps into the unseen realm to take hold of all those things, to bring them into manifestation. That brings us again to another point, as we mentioned, faith is not a feeling. It has nothing to do with your feelings. It has nothing to do with anything as far as uh, some sensation of having it. Many people are looking for feelings or sensations or whatever. That's a mistake. This is all in the spirit. You operate in the spirit. And remember, you get a general spirit of faith when you're born again. We all have the same spirit of faith. Now, your faith is to possess the inherited promises and the blessings and, and to be what you are going to live by and what you're going to walk by in every situation, whatever you do in life. We got to get specific faith. Just because you have a general spirit of faith doesn't mean that you have faith for healing, faith for deliverance, faith for uh, prosperity, faith for getting wisdom, or whatever it might be. No. We've got to get specific faith. And that comes by hearing the Word. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That tells us something. You get specific faith when you hear the Word. This is different from the general spirit of faith because we got the general spirit of faith and we're born again. We already have it. Well, this is something we get at a different time by hearing the Word. That means you're going to get faith for healing as such when you hear the Word on healing. 
faith for prosperity when you hear the word on prosperity or whatever it might be. So that tells us there's a general spirit of faith that we have, but it also tells us that we get specific faith in area after area from the word of God. And as we saw earlier, but we need to go back and see it, what are we to do when we go to possess these promises? Verse 2 of Hebrews 4, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them. Now what happens when we hear the word? Faith, remember, comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So specific faith comes as we hear the word, and that's the word gets into our heart, producing faith in our mind, it produces hope. So the word preached produces specific faith in you, but it didn't profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. What are we talking about of the mixing of your faith? That's your general spirit of faith that you mix with the specific faith that you got from hearing the word of God. In other words, you get the specific faith, then your spirit of faith is going to go into operation in some manner to be mixed with that in order to see that come to pass. And that is so important. You will be talking about that, what, how we do that as we go. Because this is a spiritual faith, and New Testament is all about spiritual realities. And you're going to possess everything through your spirit of faith manifest. Uh, in your life to, with the word that you have heard, the specific faith. In fact, this is what you're going to do everything. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, look what it says. For we walk by faith. Well, that's step by step, isn't it? That's consistently in our life. Not by sight or that which is of the outward appearance. That's why we get our focus on things that are unseen, not the things that are seen because faith operates in the unseen realm, not by the outward appearance or the seen realm. Not only do we walk by faith, this is actually what you are to live by, it says over in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. The just, that's the righteous, shall live by faith. This is the way you're to live. You live with this spirit of faith that you operate because you're gonna gain every promise you're going to gain victory. You're going to overcome by using your faith. So you're going to live by this spirit of faith that operates in you. Now, once you get, you have a general spirit of faith. You hear the specific, you hear the word, you get specific faith. What are you supposed to do? You're to mix your faith now, as we see with it. And we see this in 2 Corinthians 4. Verse 13, we having the same spirit of faith, as according it's written, I believed, therefore have I spoken. I heard the word, it produced faith, I believe that. So what am I going to do now? I'm going to mix my spirit of faith, because how do we, how's the spirit of faith operate? I believed, and therefore I've spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. The speaking is the working of your faith, or the acting upon what you believe with your faith that you have. We understand that faith not only is something that you have as a spirit of faith, but it's also a work. 1 Thessalonians 1.3 Remembering without ceasing your work of faith is a work, and you are to work your faith. In 2 Thessalonians, he even talks about it again in chapter 1, verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always, pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Well, where's the power? The power's in the word. So when you work your faith, you're going to be with the power. That means you're going to be putting the word in operation because you're going to be speaking the word or doing the word or acting upon it in some capacity. It is a work. You are to work your faith. This is, of course, how's that going to be? Because you've got the word in you, which brought, what, specific faith in the area you heard. So what's the devil going to try to do? He's going to try to stop your faith from working. So what's he going to do? He is going to come 
after the word to try to take it out of your heart. That's why you've got to be guarding your heart and make sure that you believe the word, you do the word, and you don't let the devil take it out. Mark 4, 15. These are they by the wayside where the word sown. When they've heard, Satan comes immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Why was he able to take it out? Because they didn't believe that word was one reason, or it could be because they didn't really get the understanding of it. We see this over in Matthew 13, in Matthew's account. Verse 19, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, he didn't get the understanding. And if you don't have the understanding, you're not going to be doing it and acting upon it, or believing it. The wicked one comes, catches away that was sown in his heart. At the same time, what is your responsibility for when the word comes in you? Well, here's what you're expected to do in Luke 8, 12. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word of their hearts, lest they should believe. Or having believed, this means the participle, they may be saved. Subjunctive mood. Meaning, if they believe it, it'll produce the salvation of the Lord. So what's your response to the word that comes to you? You're to believe it. And if you believe it, then, of course, we're, you're going to be working your faith, and we'll cover that in just a moment. But the devil doesn't want you to believe it. He wants you not to understand it. He wants you to, to not do what he says in some capacity, so he can take that word out of your heart, because the word is designed for you to believe and to produce the salvation of the Lord if you meet the conditions, see? And that's what he wants to accomplish. See, the devil, he's out to try to stop your faith from working. He knows that faith is what's going to give you the victory. We see over in Luke chapter 22, down in verse 31. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, referring to Peter, behold, Satan hath desired, or this is the word, actually, it's a form of the word aiteo, ex aiteo mai. He's demanded to have you. That he, and really, when he talks about demanded, this is demanding for himself because it's a middle voice. He's demanding for himself to have you. <laughs> he wants to destroy you. He wants to take you down that he may sift you as wheat. This means to, and a figuratively, an inward agitation to try to one's faith to the verge of overthrowing it. Otherwise, he wants to overthrow your faith, so your faith will do nothing, and you will not overcome. You will not see promises. You will see the enemy take that word out. Well, what did Jesus say? I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Now, that's an interesting statement. Does that mean that it, your faith will automatically not fail? No. Could your faith fail? Yeah. How do you know? Because this is a subjunctive mood statement. Jesus said, I have prayed for thee that thy faith might not fail. Well, that's good that Jesus prayed for us, but that doesn't guarantee that your faith might, not, m might fail. It could fail if you don't do what's necessary to see it work. The faith will always work. But the enemy could hinder you from seeing your faith produce, and so then your faith would fail instead of be productive in bringing the promises and giving victory for you. So it's possible for your faith to fail. It shouldn't fail. There's nothing wrong with your faith. It's what you do with your faith. The key is whether you do what's necessary to see it produce in your life. Example. Mark chapter 4, verse 40. Look at the statement he makes to them. This is when they're on the boat, and Jesus, you know, speaks to it, commands this, a peace be still, the wind cease, great calm. He said to him, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? How oh, their faith was supposed to be put in operation. Fear means no faith. You can't have fear. You've got to get rid of fear. 
God's not given you a spirit of fear. This is the same word used in 2 Timothy 1.7, dilos, which means really a timidity or be in fear. So, if you have fear, you have no faith. I mean, the enemy's going to take the word out, and he'll be successful to stop you from, your faith will essentially will fail, even though it shouldn't fail, because it's the faith of Jesus, because you allowed fear to get a hold of you. Here's another case. Matthew chapter 14. See, your response is to believe the word and act on the word and, and use the word and act on what you're supposed to do in any situation. Matthew 14, 31. This is when Peter's walking on the water, but then what happened? He saw the wind mighty and strong, and he let fear get a hold of him. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Well, Jesus immediately stretched forth his hands, caught him, and said, Oh, thou little faith. At least he had the sense to look, look back to, to want him to save him. But he has faith because he got his eyes off of the Lord. He got moved by what that, that wind that was boisterous coming at him, strong and mighty. He let fear get a hold of him. Wherefore didst thou doubt? And the word doubt is the word distazo, which means two stands. He was standing in two ways. You can't be standing in two ways and be in faith. If you're standing in two ways, you have little faith, and you have doubt, and what will happen? Your faith, of course, will not work. Doubt means you have little faith. Matthew 16. You also got to watch reasoning in your mind. Matthew 16, 8. When Jesus perceived, he said, Oh, ye of little faith, why reason among yourselves? Because you brought no bread. Hey, Jesus multiplied it in the past. Why would they be thinking these things? They were of little faith. They were not believing. And of course, what happens if you're in unbelief? You're not going to see him do anything. That means no faith. Matthew 17, 20, Jesus said to him, because of your unbelief in answer to why they couldn't cast him out. It was they had unbelief. Because of your unbelief. But verily I say unto you, if you have faith, if you may have faith, may be having subjunctive mood, if you may be having faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might, you shall say unto the mountain, remove hence to yonder place, it shall remove, nothing shall be impossible unto you. Well, that means he may not be having faith. Why would that be? Because they let doubt or unbelief, or in this case, because they were in unbelief. Their faith would be doing nothing. Their faith would be failing because of what they did. What a mistake. This is why God wants you to get to the place where your faith is operating the way it should and producing all the time. You've got to understand, faith will bring you the victory. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Whatsoever is born of God, well, that's you and I, conquers, nikao, conquers and carries off the victory over the world. This is the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. You're going to be able to overcome in anything through your faith. Well, your faith has got to be productive and victorious, and it cannot be failing, which means you need to get rid of anything that's hindering it. It's an interesting statement that he makes over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 10, he said, Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. The word perfect is not the word for perfection. It is the word which is katarizo, which means really, to, in this sense, to mend or to repair or to fix it, so to speak. Why? Because it says that which is lacking or deficient in your faith. Meaning if your faith is not functioning the way it should be, we got to get this thing fixed. We've got to get, get in line. So he's come on to come and to fix or to mend or repair or get things right so that you're not lacking or deficient in your faith any longer. Your faith is supposed to be producing. It's what you live by. It's how you possess everything. That's how you get victory. 
So he, they were going to come and correct these guys and get them in line. We must always believe the Word when it comes to us. Remember that the Word produces faith. Now, believing the Word is important as well. That's our response to the Word that comes to us. Belief is based on the fact that you know that God's Word is the truth. You know it's spiritual law. You believe it. You know it. You have ab absolutely know it's gonna, that God will bring it to pass. In fact, Belief is really based on knowing that the Word is true. We can really see this in 1 John 4, verse 16. Look what it says. We have known and have believed, literally is what it says, the love that God hath to us. First we know it, and then we believe it. You've got to get knowledge. And as you get the knowledge and you know things, then your response to it is to believe the Word of God. And if you believe the Word of God, then you're going to act upon it. You're going to do it. You're going to put your faith in operation. Belief, of course, will always show action on the Word if it's true belief. Otherwise, it just becomes mental assent. Well, I believe that, but you don't do anything about it. I believe if I cast out the demons, I'll get free. But are you casting them out? No. Well, you may believe it, but you're, you're, you're not really believing it, because if you really believed it, you would be doing it. So therefore, belief is a response to knowing something which is going to be shown by action. In fact, it's important for you to understand there's a difference between faith and belief. Faith is a result of God's work in you and the fact that you have a general spirit of faith came from a God. Also, you get specific faith coming from the Word is what produces that in your heart. So where, how, where is faith coming from? That's coming from God. What is belief? Belief is our response to that Word that has come to us. God's not making us believe. You have to choose to believe the Word of God. So faith is God's work in you. Belief is your response to the Word of God. But also then, there's more than just believing. Because believing will always then be shown by another thing you do, which is working your faith. In other words, there's really two aspects to faith. You get faith from God, and then you do something with your faith, working your faith. When you get faith from God, then you believe that Word that came then you begin to work your faith to put it in operation. That is your part. So faith has an aspect that comes totally from God, but it also is to be put in operation by you and me. He's not going to put it in operation. You've got to put it in operation by speaking and or doing the Word of God. For example, you hear the Word on deliverance. You can cast out the demons and get set free. You believe that Word. Well, if you believe that word, now I'm going to work my faith and begin to do it. That is my, that is my faith put in operation. But you couldn't do, unless you had heard the word that produces faith, you're not going to be able to do that without having the word in you. So you hear the word, it produces the faith from God, you believe that word, your response to it, and then you work your faith as you're acting upon it, otherwise... That belief isn't real belief. It's like mental assent. Oh, yeah, I, I believe that. But then you're not doing anything to cause that the, the promise to come to pass or see your faith produce the result, which is what you do when you work your faith. You put it in operation. And again, this is what we see if we go back to that 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13. We having the same spirit of faith, According as it's written, I believed, what I do? I believe the word that's coming into me, and therefore have I spoken. That is me working my faith by speaking. We believe and therefore speak. So faith is to be put not only something that we receive from God through the word, but also it's what we put in operation in the spirit, in the spiritual realm, to produce the spiritual results. Now, you're going to have to hold fast to your faith and continue in it. That's important. Some people don't. 
they applied their faith for one minute and then they go off in some other direction and they don't continue in faith. Well, that's a mistake. 1 Timothy 1.19, holding or having faith, holding on to this thing, having it, consistently, I mean, you don't just have it for a moment. No, you continue in it. You continue working your faith. And a good conscience, with some having put away concerning faith, have made it shipwreck. If you don't keep your faith operating, or if you let go of it, or you, it fails for you because you don't do what he says consistently, your faith will be shipwrecked. That's like, hey, it failed, it crashed. <laughs> it's not supposed to crash. It's the faith of Jesus. It will always bring total victory unless you don't do the right thing. Now, here in chapter 4, we see even see, what is, look what it says happens in the last days. 1 Timothy 4, 1, Now the Spirit speaks expressly, In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. <laughs> well, that means their faith isn't going to work. It's going to fail. It shouldn't fail, but it's going to fail for them because they've departed from their faith. And how did that happen? Two things it tells us. They gave heed to seducing spirits, misleading spirits, got into error. Uh, they're not following the Word of God. They must have been listening to some false spirits. That's why you've got to watch what you hear. You must always check things out in line with the Word of God. Do not follow seducing, deceiving spirits. And what's the second thing? Doctrines of devils. That'll cause you to depart from the faith. Because the faith will only work based on what the Word says. And if your doctrine's not right, your faith is going nowhere. It will not work. You've actually departed from the faith if you have a false doctrine. That's why doctrine is so important. Because remember, the doctrine, the Word in you, is what produced the faith from God. And if you don't have the right doctrine, how can you don't have faith to produce anything? Therefore, People depart from faith by giving heed to deceiving spirits or and or doctrines of devils that are contrary to the Word. We see something else. 2 Timothy 3.8 Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate or not approved concerning the faith. Anybody that resists the truth will not be approved concerning the faith. Their faith won't work. That's, again, why we have to be ready to receive the truth. We've got to make sure that we're following the truth and not error or something that's not that's half truths and following something that's really not exactly in line with the Word of God. These guys were resisting the truth. Anybody that resists the truth of the Word, they will not be approved concerning the faith. So that's why doctrine is so important. We cannot resist it. People that shows you people that aren't correctable, <laughs> they fail concerning the faith if they won't correct the problems. Many people they just they continue to f f wonder why they're flailing in their Christian life because they haven't received the correction that God was trying to bring to them, and so <laughs> here they are. They're trying. They may be uh, believing things over here in other areas, but the area where He's trying to get them in line with, they didn't respond. You resist the truth, you're going to be not approved concerning the faith. We have to come in line. Also, remember you're going to believe, so therefore you're going to speak. And what am I going to speak? I am going to speak these things into being, but what am I going to speak into being? What the promise of God is. Therefore, you get the scripture promise, which is your right or your inherited promise, your inherited right, your legal spiritual right according to the covenant. And you're going to bring that, you're going to speak that, the promise of God. And then you're also going to then speak into being to bring this into manifestation. For instance, if it says that by the stripes you were healed, that is a promise. That is my right now in Christ because of what Jesus accomplished. That's in the document of the New Testament. Now what am I going to do? Then therefore I'm going to come and I'm going to take hold of healing for God to produce that promise in my life. This is how we have to learn how to confess the word accurately. You confess the promise that belongs to you 
and then you speak it or do something to bring it into manifestation. A good example would be on the area of mercy. 1 Peter chapter 2, look here in verse 10. Or, I'm sorry, it's 1 Peter. What am I doing there? 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 10. Where in time past were not a people, were now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. What is that? That is a promise that we now have in the New Testament. Because I have obtained mercy, does that mean mercy is automatically coming to me? No. It's the promise that belongs to me in the New Testament, in the document of the New Testament. It's a part of our inheritance, right? So, when I speak to, a, uh, to see mercy come to pass, I am going to declare my right, which is in the document, which is that now I have obtained mercy because I'm in Christ. So I'm going to speak my legal right by declaring the past tense scriptures that give me the promise, I have obtained mercy. By speaking that, though, that doesn't release mercy. That just speaks what my legal right is according to the inheritance, the promise of God. Because there's another scripture that shows what we would do to bring that mercy into manifestation, and that would be Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain lambano, take hold of. And this, of course, is going to be a conditional statement, as it is, subjunctive mood, because I have to do this part, that I may take hold of mercy and find grace to help in time of need. One verse says, you have obtained mercy. Now we have obtained it, past tense. This one tells me what I do to experientially see that mercy come into manifestation. I may take hold of this mercy. So one is the legal right. The other is speaking what, God, you're, what you're doing to bring God's release of that mercy to come to pass. I'm supposed to come boldly to the throne of grace and take hold of that lambano, which is what we do in prayer. This is why... Two aspects to confession. One is your legal right, the promise of God, iteo, what de a demand of what's due you. Two is taking hold of that to see that come into manifestation, where you take hold of the promise. Remember what we talked about in Mark 11, 24. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, I tell you, I demand of what's due you. We pointed this out the last time. When you pray, believe that you receive, take hold of it. Okay, so I have this promise. I'm going to make a demand of what's due me by bringing the scripture promise. And then I'm going to put my faith in operation. I believe I take hold of it, which is bringing then that legal right to bring it into manifestation, because I'm speaking forth what God is doing for me now as I am taking hold of it, obeying His Word. That brings it into manifestation. So there's the two aspects. One, declaring the promise. And the same thing we saw over in Accurate New Testament Prayer in John 16, 23. Remember what we do? Whatsoever you shall I tell you, make a demand of what's due you, the Father in my name, He'll give it you. And what am I supposed to do? Hitherto you've made a demand of what's due, nothing in my name. Make a demand of what's due you, I tell you, and you shall take hold of it. The making a demand of what's due you is speaking the scripture promise, my legal right. The taking hold of it is the application of my faith to speak it into being or take hold of it. And I do it with my mouth. I take hold of that particular promise. And in doing so, then that releases that. And that's speaking what God will be doing for you now as he performs his word in your life. That's so important. We see another scripture over in Matthew 21. So you've got to learn how to confess the word accurately. That's why he wrote that little book. All things, which would be all things that belong to you, whatsoever you shall, I tell you, make a demand of what's due you, this means, by bringing the scripture promise, your word says such and such, 
your, like your word says, that I have obtained mercy. In prayer, believing, I believe that, you shall lambano take of, I take hold of that mercy. I come boldly to the throne of grace and I take hold of your mercy. Why can I take hold of mercy? Because I have obtained mercy. I have a promise. So I'm going to speak the promise, my legal right, and then I'm going to take hold of it, speaking it into being. I believe that I take hold of that mercy to flow into me. That is how you're applying your faith to working your faith. Same thing in the area of, let's say, in uh, moving a mountain. And also, you must understand, every time you speak, you're always doing things in a present tense application, and it's working now. Mark 11, 23. For verily I say unto whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith it says in the King James, shall come to pass, they'll have whatsoever he saith. So, do we have authority over mountains and speak to mountains? Can we command mountains to be removed? Yes. What do we do? I'm going to do something to release the faith that I have to move that mountain by speaking commanding words to it. Be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea. When I'm doing that, you must believe that those things which you are saying and continuing to say, because you don't just speak one time, present tense, not shall come to pass sometime in the future, mistake. It's ginamai. It's not a future tense verb. It is a present tense verb. The way you would translate this is, those things which he is saying and continuing to say are coming to pass continually. Every time I speak, it's happening. It's happening. It's happening. It's happening. You must believe that. If you think, well, it shall come to pass, you're not, your faith is shot. Your faith got shipwrecked. It has failed on you because that's not what faith does. Faith always puts things into operation and it's happening now. So you declare that, as he said, that that is coming to pass. Those things which you say are coming to pass. And it's really so simple. We see this in deliverance, so simple. We command the demons to come out. Well, is something happening then? Yes, it is, regardless of whether they come out. We command them to come out. We're working our faith, right? We keep speaking, and then finally they start coming out. Maybe they come out the first time when you speak. They might. Sometimes they do. Sometimes it takes a while to get the spirits to release out. But every time you speak, it's working. It's happening. It's happening. It's happening. It's happening. And that's important. Anytime you use your authority, every time you speak, you must believe that it's happening, otherwise you're not in faith. That is important. And you're going to work your faith. You have a spiritual faith, and we've got to learn how to work it accurately. And this is something you're going to continue in. It's not going to be a one-time thing, and then you go off in some other direction. No. Look what he says. In fact, let's back up one verse, and he talks about in verse uh, 22, speaking of what Jesus did in the body of his flesh through death, he accomplished the redemption. And what is he, what's he, what's he going to be doing? To present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. Well, that's where we're going to be end up headed. You're going to be come to. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled. Well, if you don't continue in the faith, are you going to be presented holy and unblameable and unreprovable? No. Otherwise, you've got to continue in this. We are going to continue in faith at all times because we walk by it and we live by it, and we're going to continue to work our faith continually, present tense. If you are continuing, continuing ongoingly in the faith, we see also speaks of this over in chapter 2, verse 5. For though I be absent in the faith, yet am I with you in the spirit, joining and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith. Your faith needs to be steadfast. This means firm. That means it's going to be solid, like in a military sense, that God, this word means, to be solid, firm. It's not moved. It's set. Your faith should be set. If you're wavering, doubting, up and down, you aren't in the faith. 
you've let doubt get a hold of you or wavering, and that'll stop you from seeing the promises of God come to pass. Your faith won't work. Verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Again, firm, established, made sure in the faith. As you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Why am I abounding with thanksgiving? Because that's how you, you bring thanksgiving when you're taking hold of something. I thank you as I'm taking hold of your healing power. I thank you as I'm taking hold of your wisdom or whatever it might be. And you're speaking that you're abounding with that as you're taking hold of that with thanksgiving because you know it belongs to you. And that's how you are applying your faith, working it to see it come to pass. Let's make another statement here. Trials do not produce patience or strengthen your faith. <laughs> you hear it all the time. Oh, that trial is going to give me patience. That trial will produce strengthen my faith. <laughs> no, it won't. The Word is what produces patience or steadfastness. And it's the Word is what strengthens your faith. Not the trial. The trial is designed to wipe out your faith, stop your faith from working. Luke 21, 19, in your patience, your steadfastness, possess your soul. Steadfastness on what? On the Word. That is what you must realize. In fact, what do trials do? Actually, trials will determine if you have steadfastness on the Word, if you have patience or not, because it'll bring it in operation. We know this from James chapter 1. James chapter 1, when it talks about knowing this, the trying of your faith works patience or steadfastness. It's going to work means to bring into about operation or bring about your steadfastness. Well, if you don't have steadfastness, is it going to bring it about? No. <laughs> you're going to get wiped out. You're, you'll be shut down. Your trial will be successful against you and knock your faith out. No, you're just going to bring into operation steadfastness and steadfastness is to have its perfecting work so you might be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Because you need steadfastness in the area of the soul so you don't yield to the trial attacking you, trying to shut down your faith and take the word out of you. Trials are designed to take the word out of you. <laughs> That's what they come. Remember it says, after the parable of the sower, affliction and persecution comes, arises for the word's sake. That's why it's showing up. It's coming to get the word out of you. We'll go back to that, Mark 4, in verse 16. It's amazing how people follow for all these traditions, think that trials are going to strengthen me. <laughs> trials are going to get me established in the word. No, they're not. It's lies. Mark 4, 16, he receives the word with gladness have no root in themselves. Why? Because they haven't been hearing and doing the Word. They haven't got established. No foundation. Endure for it for a time, but afterward when affliction or persecution, well, that's the trial, the attack, the pressure or the persecution arises. Why? For the Word's sake. For what? To get it out of you. <laughs> Immediately they're offended. Well, they draw back from the Word. They get stumbled and they made a, did not follow in the way of the Word of God. So trials are designed to stop your faith from working. This is why if you're going to see victory, you must maintain steadfastness in the area of the soul. Because where is the battleground? The battleground is in the area of the soul. The enemy will come against your mind, your will, your emotions, trying to get you to think negative or not act on the word. Anything to get you off of believing the word and operating your faith. And look what it says in Hebrews 10, 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. Well, what shall we be doing? For you have need of steadfastness in the soulish realm, so you don't get taken down. That after you've done the will of God, you might receive. This is the word commizo, which means to carry off. You're going to carry off the promise. You're going to see it come to manifestation. This is why we need to be steadfast. And another thing that's important in Hebrews chapter 6, you also need to be long-suffering. We saw this earlier, but let's look at it again. Ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith, your faith is in operation, 
and remember this is the word macrothumia, which means long-suffering. Long-suffering here. Why long-suffering? Because in the face of circumstances that haven't changed, you need that fruit of long-suffering so you don't throw in the towel and give up. See, long-suffering is the opposite of giving up and throwing in the towel. If I'm long-suffering, I'm going to stick at it. I'm going to keep casting out until I'm free. I'm not going to cast out a once or twice and say, I didn't see anything happen, so I'm going to throw in the towel and give up. No. I'm going to continue to cast out, continue to take hold of healing, continue to do the Word, whatever it is, until I see the results. Through faith and long-suffering are inheriting, remember, the promises. It's a process, isn't it? It's not going to be just instant. You might have some things happen instantly. When they do, praise God. But almost everything that we possess is going to be an ongoing process of inheriting the promises of God. And that brings us to another point. Of course, you're going to have to be ready to fight against any attacks that come against you. That's why it speaks about fighting the good fight of faith. And it's going to be in the realm of the Spirit against the enemy. 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. You're going to contend with the adversaries. Anytime he's coming at you, you're going to attack. You're going to hold up that shield of faith and quench the, the enemies with the fiery, dart, the fiery darts with that shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one by speaking the word. You're going to fight that fight of faith against the enemy and conquer anything that would come against you. That's, we need to make sure you're not letting the enemy get to you. Your faith is what you live by and what will give you total victory in your life. Now, there's another thing we have to realize. We've already talked about it a little bit, but you've got to realize you've got to work your faith. If you don't work your faith, your faith will not produce. James 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, he's having faith, and hath not works? Can faith save him? The answer is no. Verse 17. Even so faith, if it is not having works, is dead, being alone, or more literally, by itself. Faith, there's nothing wrong with faith, but you've got to have works, putting it in operation. Remember, faith comes because you heard the Word. You believe the Word, and then what do you do? There's another thing you do with your faith. You work your faith. You put your faith in operation, apply your faith to see that, and that's the working of faith. We come to verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me, this is what the King James says, Thy faith without, or out of thy works, more literally, it's the word ek, out of thy works, and I will show thee my faith out of my works. More literally, Young's brings it out in the word order. He says, show me thy faith out of thy works. I will show thee out of my works my faith. That's literally what it says. Otherwise, how do we know that you have faith? It's going to be shown out of your works. If you're not doing the word, speaking the word, acting on the word in some aspect, you may have faith, but you're, you're not working your faith, and it's not producing in your life. Again, get back to deliverance for a moment. Well, I believe I can get delivered and cast out all these demons. Well, are there works of you doing it? If you're not doing it, then your faith is alone. It's dead. It's not operating to produce for you. How are you going to show your f true faith? He says, out of my works, I'm showing my faith. Your works show your faith. We come to verse 20. Wilt thou know, O vain man, or devoid of truth, it's quite a, kind of really a correcting statement against him, that faith, now the word without is this word charis, which means apart from. Faith apart from works is dead. It's not operating. It's not doing anything. Otherwise, you have to have works coupled together with it. Was Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Yeah, 
God said, go up, offer your son. Okay, I, I believe that. <laughs> if he didn't go, well, he wouldn't have performed it, would he? He had to go up there and tie his son up there, get the knife ready to do it like he was going through with it. And when the, well, of course, the lamb was provided. So he had to have the works, didn't he? Your works show your faith. Just believing, that's your response to the word, but working your faith is applying that. Just believing doesn't produce the results unless you work it. That's important to realize. I have a lot of people say, well, I'm believing God to heal me. Well, that's great. Why would that be? Because by His stripes you were healed. That's your promise, right? And you're believing that promise. Great. So what are you doing? Well, I'm just believing God to do it. Well, wait a minute. What's your, what's your work of faith? What do you mean my work of faith? I'm just believing. Some people think all you got to do is just believe. They say, well, doesn't it say in there about only believing? Well, yeah, remember Jesus said, fear not and only believe, because what was going to happen? He was going to work the faith of raising her for the dead. He had to believe so that then that work would be done. But there had to be a work of faith. His believing didn't break, raise her up. Jesus raised her up by working the faith. Somebody had to work the faith. And in that case, that's why. Otherwise, your faith has to have works. Seeing now how faith wrought, this is a Greek word, ener soon energio, which means working together with. And when it speaks of this, faith was, imperfect tense, ongoing action in the past, how faith was working together with his works. That shows you faith and works work together. You can have faith, but you may not have works. It's not doing anything. You got to be working your faith. Faith working together with his works by works was faith made perfect, or it came to per completion and the result, because you worked it. That is important. The scripture was fulfilled, which said Abraham believed God, was imputed to him for righteousness, he was called the friend of God. And what did he do? He, followed, he obeyed God, told him what he was supposed to do to go out for the possess the inheritance, remember, by his faith. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only or alone. You've got to have works. Let's just give you an example. Well, for, we'll finish this first. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she'd received the messengers and sent them out another way. That's right. She had to do something, didn't she? And that was her work of faith. For as the body, not without, but it's the same word charis, apart, as the body apart from the spirit is dead, as Young's brings out. Well, that would be true. If we don't have the spirit, our body's dead, right? Faith, apart from works, is dead as well. You have faith, but your faith is not doing anything if you don't have the works. Let's just take it in the area of like for being born again. I believe that Jesus Christ paid the price and accomplished the what was necessary for me to be saved. Otherwise, I'm believing. Well, if I believe, then I'm going to have some action, aren't I? Look what it says in John 1.12. As many as received him, to them gave he the authority or power to be a right, right to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. In other words, I believe on his name, and he's given me the authority to become the sons of God, so what do I need to do? I've got to have a work. What's my work? Receiving him. I just can't, couldn't say I believe and then never receive him. Would it ever be shown, would the result come into my life that I become a, a child of God, a son of God? It's a child of God here, a technon. No, I got to receive him. That's my work. I got to work it. Here's another good example. Sarah. 
Remember, she laughed at first, but then she got on board. And she had to get her faith in operation. She had to receive that seed that came from Abraham into her womb to produce and to be, a con to con be conceived. Because remember, her womb was, they spoke about the deadness of her womb. Otherwise, she had to receive that so that would conceive and would be, there would be life that would come into that. And she would then have, be able to have a child. Look what it says. Sarah, al or fa through faith, also Sarah herself, Lombano, took hold of. Dunamis, for the word strength, power, to be conceiving the seed. Otherwise, she had to take hold of the power of God for this conception or the depositing of this, the seed in her womb so that she then brought forth the child. She couldn't just believe. She had to do something. She had to take hold of power to conceive the seed, and she did. We must understand, your faith will, is what you live by. It is a spiritual faith that we put in operation, and it will bring total victory for us if we do. In fact, remember, just because you have faith doesn't mean it's working for you. In fact, when he touched their eyes in Matthew 8, 9, 29, he said, according to your faith, be it unto thee. Or this is the command. This is actually a command that he's speaking to them. According to your faith, come to pass. And it did, because their faith was an operation. You must understand, your faith is going to bring everything into operation. But again, it's important for you to realize it's a spiritual faith. You have a general spirit of faith when you're born again. You get specific faith through hearing the word. That's all God doing that. Your response is to believe that word. When you believe that word, then you're going to mix your spirit of faith, believe in it, you're going to confess, speak, do, work your faith in some aspect to see that come into manifestation. It's important to realize the two aspects of faith. You get it from God, actually three aspects in a sense. You have general spirit of faith, then you get specific faith, then you work your faith, acting on the Word. And your response in the meantime, in the middle, is believe, and don't let any doubt, unbelief, or anything come in, or discouragement, whatever it might be. You can't let that, or that'll shut down your faith. You'll be in no faith, little faith. You know, you won't see the promises come to pass, and your faith can become shipwreck if you get off track. Always guard your faith and make sure that you're not letting the devil come in and steal it. One last set of scriptures we'll just look at quickly. Romans 4, 17 and following shows the God kind of faith. This is Abraham, and the last part says, Calleth those things which be not as though they were. This is Ab the God kind of faith from Abraham. Calleth is present tense. Be is a present participle being. Call those things that are not being as though they not were, it's a present participle as well, being. Call those things that are not being as being. Because what am I always doing? Remember, faith is always bringing something into being now. I'm speaking in that mountain, is being, it's being moved now. I'm casting out the demon, the authority is working to drive that out now, whether it came out at that moment or not. I'm speaking, it's happening now. So, you're going to call those things that are not happening as happening. They're happening. That's faith. If you're not doing that, your faith is not working. And then you've got to maintain hope, because faith is the substance of things hoped for. Who against hope believed in hope. See, that's where you believe. You believe the word in your heart for faith, and you believe that word in your mind producing hope, a confident expectancy of what God will do. 
that he might become the father of many nations. What was his basis for hope? Because of what was spoken, so shall thy seed be. The word is your basis for that, hope as well as faith. Being not weak in faith, I know that means this would shut his faith down, he considered not his own body now dead, about 100 years old, and neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. You cannot consider the natural. Well, I don't see something happening. I said, I don't see anything, I don't feel anything, nothing's changing. Now you just shut your faith down. You just wiped it out. You shipwrecked your faith for sure. That's weak in faith. You can't be weak in faith without strength, powerless in faith, essentially. No. It's a spiritual thing. It's operating in the spirit. It's a spirit of faith. We're functioning in the realm of the spirit. Your faith is working in the spirit. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Do not ever let yourself stagger at the promise of God. Believe always. You're commanded to believe, remember. But was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Again, you're giving glory to God, thanking Him for what He is accomplishing because you're, you know what he's doing is you're speaking into being or acting on the word in some aspect. That'll keep you strong in faith. And being fully persuaded that what he'd promised he was able also to perform. You must be fully persuaded. That's someone who believes and there's no doubt, there's no unbelief, there's no, nothing hindering you whatsoever. You are fully persuaded that the promise he is powerful his power uh, operates to perform it, to bring it into manifestation. God is a performer of his word. So, so important. You got inheritance. You got all these promises and blessings. They don't automatically come. You got to meet the conditions, of course. And you got to realize it's all going to come through faith. He's given you a general spirit of faith. This is what you live by and walk by. We've got to get the word in us exactly. If we have wrong doctrine, that'll you depart from the faith. You get deceived by listening to the false things, you depart from the faith. You've got to guard yourself. You've got to get the word in you. Believe the word. Never let doubt or fear or anything get a hold of you. Always believe it. And then mix your faith with the word that you heard. Otherwise, it won't profit you. It's not automatic. You've got to work your faith. And you work your faith continually until you see the results. We keep casting out till those spirits come out. And as some come out, we keep casting them out till we get rid of all of them. We keep taking hold of the promise and speaking into being until we see the promises come to pass. We keep speaking of that mountain, command it to be removed until it's removed. Otherwise, you work your faith continually. And remember, if faith doesn't have works, it's dead, being alone. It's not put in operation. So remember also, as we pointed out, the three aspects of the faith. You have a general spirit of faith. You get specific faith through the word. You believe that word. Now you work your faith to bring that into manifestation in some aspect. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you. I am understanding New Testament spiritual reality. I understand. I have a spiritual inheritance that's reserved in heaven this spiritual inheritance I am to take hold of. It has promises and spiritual blessings that have already been given to me. And I am going to see them come to pass in my life. It's going to happen through my faith. My faith is a spirit of faith. It operates in the spiritual realm to bring the promises into manifestation. I have a general spirit of faith then I get specific faith through the word that tells me the promises. I believe that word. I will never let myself get out of belief. And then I take hold and activate my faith, working my faith to see that promise come into manifestation or to cast out that demon or to move that mountain I work my faith continually until I see the results. As I learn to do this, and I speak things into being, I call things not being as being. I speak to mountains, and what I'm saying, it's happening continually. 
I command the demons to come out in the name of Jesus. It's happening. Whether they release out at that moment or not, I continue to command until they start coming out. I will always work my faith continually and see the victory come forth in every area. Every promise, all my inheritance, all the spiritual blessings will come to pass. And as I mix my faith, I will enter in to the spiritual rest and I will be a partaker of the divine nature. I will possess everything that God has given unto me with my spirit of faith. Thank you for the revelation of the spiritual realm in the New Testament and the spiritual realities. I will operate in the spirit and I will see total victory in every area of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. I trust this has helped you and seeing spiritual reality, how it works, and how you bring everything into being. And don't fall for any of those ones that say, well, I'm believing God to do such and such. And that's all you're doing. I mean, you'll be waiting forever. You need to be working your faith to see it come to pass. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. Thank you for this rev continued revelation of the New Testament spiritual realities that we're being established in so we see you accomplish everything that you purpose for us. All the promises, all the spiritual blessings are coming to pass. We're entering into your spiritual rest. We're possessing everything and getting free and having total victory in every area because we are hearers and doers of this word, working our faith continually. Thank you for much fruit as we continue to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We've got more to talk about on New Testament spiritual realities. We'll continue on on Sunday morning. Praise God. I trust it's been a blessing in helping you. And if you haven't ever heard this, it should have really helped you. If you heard it before, it should help to drive this home. And maybe if you haven't been on board on it, you need to get on board and always put your faith in operation. Praise God. You need prayer. I invite you to come forward. Otherwise, God bless. Have a great week as you're working your faith continually. God bless.